So for you personally, you know, having been an Alice in Chains fan prior to actually working with Alice in Chains, what was that experience like for you the first day that you actually got to work with them in the studio? It, it, it was pretty in, insane. I mean, like, okay, so let's pan back to, like, uh, 92, 93. I just moved to Phoenix, Arizona, because I couldn't find work in L.A. I had, like, long, crazy hair back then. I wanted to be in a band and a guitar player. And uh, so I had friends in Arizona. I got a job at this place called Zia Records. And Arizona... Hey, everybody in Phoenix, great city. I didn't want to be there. I needed to be back in L.A. So I just worked my ass off. But anyways, uh, I got the chore or task of like building the Alice in Chains end cap for dirt. And it was like a contest. And, and you know, we played that thing all day long, and it was amazing. So, you know, I'm building this giant end cap with all the, uh, you know, the, the, the album artwork, and the release date and all the stacking of all the CDs. Anyways, go, you know, 2008, when those guys all roll into the studio, I'm like, you know, okay, this is really happening. But the, I think the most exciting part was when Nick and I were dialing in Jerry's guitar sound. Jerry's like, you know, all right, let's start guitars tomorrow. And we're like, all right. So me and Nick get all the heads together and we pick up his rampage and, uh, you know, we start playing through and I'm like, wow, you know, and Nick is like, dude, that's it. That guitar is the sound. Mostly it's his hands, but yeah, that rampage is something pretty unique. And, you know, you play that through his amps and you can get pretty close. You were just mentioning Jerry Contrell. How did you get your relationship started with Allison Chains? Wow, man, this goes back, I think to about 2008. Uh, I was on vacation and my producer, Nick Raskulenix, calls me up and he's like, you know, he's like, big, you know, uh, how do you feel about doing an Alice in Chains record? And I was like, you know, I'm a guitar player. And of course, I'm, you know, that would be amazing. So, you know, uh, we started uh, at 606, Dave Grohl's studio. And then, uh, you know, that was right when, you know, the band were kind of like, you know, getting their things together. Everyone was like, uh, you know, they're all newly sober, pretty much. And Jerry had some, like, you know, this crazy, scraggly long beard. And he was pretty surly back then. You know, he had his wall up for a while until, you know, it took a couple of weeks. But, you know, we did that record. It turned out great. We did, I, you know, I was there for all of the demos for Devil Put Dinosaurs here. And, you know, we just, you know, got a, it was a closer relationship because I'm there, you know, in his most vulnerable spot, you know, right where he's creating. And, uh, you know, we just became cool friends that way. And then, you know, we did the record and, you know, same thing with Rainier Fog. How did working with uh, Alice in Chains on three of their records, how, are they, is there anything unique about them compared to some of the other bands you've worked with in terms of their studio approach? Um, no, they're, they're, I mean, they're more old school. They're not trying to jam everything down in, 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 in like a, you know, a couple of days, like, you know, oh, we got to get the drums down, done in a couple of days and then we'll start on guitars. It's more like, we're going to do the drums until they're done and, and everybody's cool. And then we're going to start all the guitars. We're going to make sure all the guitars are done and they're just not in any type of a rush. They want, you know, they wanted, they want their record to sound the way they want it to sound like in their heads, like they have a high bar of where they want it to be and we'll take the time to get it there. That is, that is awesome. Do you know yeah. if, um, so since obviously Alice in Chains, they've had, you know, two separate eras, right? The Lane era and the yes. Will era. Do you know if uh, they've approached um, like writing music and recording music differently with Will than they did with Lane? You know, um, I wasn't there for the Lane sessions, but on these last three, you know, Jerry will come up with, he'll demo pretty much everything, you know, he'll sketch everything out and then he brings it to the band and they, they flesh that out. Um, I can only assume it was closer to that back in the day, uh, but I know Lane was playing guitar. Um, I just... I can't tell you. I, all I know right now is that, you know, Will will, will will submit songs. You know, Sean had some songs. 
Mike Inez will bring in some bass riffs and, you know, Jerry will, you know, put together like full, you know, arranged demos and, you know, it, you know, it's a democratic process and they go through it until they've got the record they want to have. That's awesome. And of the three mm-hmm. records you worked on with them, is there any one that was your favorite to work on? I'd say, uh, well, they're all great, uh, you know, and, and for different reasons. Uh, you know, the first one, because it was the first one and meeting those guys and getting to know all of them, uh, we were at Dave Grohl's studio, which was super fun. And then we went to Henson Studios and, you know, kind of created a home there. Uh, Double the Dinosaurs here, we were all... We start to finish at Henson, and you know that's a couple of miles from my house. That was fun too. Um, I'd have to say uh, Rainier Fog, just because I got to go to Seattle and track where those guys did their last record with Lane, and that's where it got emotional for those guys. Not that they got weird, but they knew they were back, and you know the last time they were there, they were with Lane, and now we're here with Will. And, you know, two new guys, Nick and myself. And, uh, you know, we just, we dug in deep and, you know, set up and, you know, recorded over the summer. It was pretty awesome. So they, was that your first time in Seattle, going up to there for Rainier Fog? No, I'd been there before. I'd, I used to be in a band called Amen, and we toured all over the place. And, uh, so yeah, so, uh, and then, yeah, I actually, one of my old bands played the Temple Theater out in Tacoma, and we, you know, I, I, I've been around Seattle, but like every time we were in Seattle, it's, you know, raining or, or actually this band Bluebird I was in go up there. Yeah, it's cloudy and raining. We played the off ramp or whatever it's called now. And, you know, just hammered and drive back down, back down to LA. Yeah, man. So just about yourself then, how did mm-hmm. you personally get into the music world? Well, uh, okay. So my parents owned a jazz club growing up. And uh, so I was just kind of exposed to music early on. You know, I'm like a five-year-old walking through the jazz club, and I've got, you know, this, you know, whoever's on stage or what they call it a stage, it's like this high. Um, <clears throat> you know, all these great musicians that I, now I look back and I'm like, wow, I, I was hanging out with Louis Belson, you know, all these weird things, and, or Lionel Hampton. And uh, it's just like, okay, uh, you know, rolling in and, you know, the drummer's hitting the snare and it's making my eyes blink and I don't know why and, you know, because they're really going off and, you know, go see my parents or, you know, my mom brings us in, say bye to my dad, go home, go to sleep. But it, I think it was uh, my neighborhood friends, you know, all of a sudden, you know, Van Halen 2 came out, or Van Halen 1 came out and they're like, you got to hear this and put it on and I instantly knew, I'm like, like my brain melted because you know I, I'll hear jazz guitar or whatever's going on in the club. Uh, my parents, you know, weren't you know big rockers at all. Uh, and then you know that was all my friends, you know, and you know just finding metal whatever we can get our hands on. And uh, so we started a band, and I've just been playing ever since. That is awesome. I had yeah. a very similar experience with Van Halen. I was 14, <laughs> I think. Yeah. And yeah. first time, the first time I heard Eruption, I, I, my brain melted, basically, like you said. And it's funny because um, the parts where he's shredding in the first half of that solo, that wasn't as impressive to me as the tapping, even though the tapping is a lot easier, right? Yeah. So when I heard that, I was like, what am I listening to? You know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah. Which is crazy. Uh, so funny. I've seen some videos where Jerry can really shred. Uh, do you know if they would ever make a record where they go more along the lines of being, I guess, uh, technical, so to speak, like more of like a technical kind of record? You know, uh, Jerry likes crafting his solos. It, it, like, you know, he, he, you know, he, he can get, he can get flashy too. Uh, but, uh, I think he likes to be able to sing them in his head. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, uh, who knows? I mean, like this solo record, there's a lot of guitars, but, not a lot of, I mean, there's solos, but not, it's not like a shredder record. Yeah. Oh, back to the eruption side note. That was my wedding song. Really? When I, when I came out. Yeah, it was pretty awesome. <laughs> and I walked out. It was pretty awesome. That's hilarious. My cousins yeah. got married last year. My cousins, no. I had two cousins <laughs> who got married on like different, you know what I mean? So uh, it, one, of cousins, uh, <laughs> one of my cousins, one of my cousins, their uh, intro was the Game of Thrones intro. 
which is pretty cool. Oh, wow. There you go. The first Alice in Chains record you worked on, Black Gives Way to Blue, was also the first Alice in Chains record the band had worked on since Lane's passing. So, you know, with that said, was there any sort of uncomfortable feeling for the band being in the studio without Lane? You know, th- that record, I, to me, I think, was their cathartic, you know, release. Uh, they did that, you know, the last song on the record, Black is Lady Blue, is their goodbye, you know, letter to Lane. And, uh, you know, if you listen to, you know, the first song, All Secrets Known, that's kind of sets the tone for the whole thing. And uh, it wasn't until everybody was, you know, Throughout the whole record, everyone was all gung ho. They were really excited. Everything was sounding great. They were glad to be in the studio doing Alice in Chains again. You know, Will comes in, he's fresh new energy, and, you know, it was really fun. Uh, when we were tracking vocals for the song Black Gives Way to Blue, that's when things got really emotional. And, you know, everybody had to kind of take a break and let things settle for a second, you know. Uh, you know, just thinking about it that day, it was really. You know, everybody felt Wayne that on that song, particularly tracking it. And I can imagine for William, I mean, that was his first go with Alice in Chains. Do you know, it must have been big shoes for him to fill. How did he feel personally? Do you know? I mean, you know, Will is highly intelligent and seriously talented singer. I mean, his range is so, you know... You know he can get way up there, and you know he's got the the power. Um, I, I, you know, he knew he had big shoes to fill. I wasn't talking with him a lot about it. You know, it was like he'd come in and work with Nick on vocals. Uh, I'd be there for him if he had a guitar part, and you know we, you know, just trying to be there and support him because he is he's the new guy. You know, first it was you know Mike Inez, and now he's you know he's not. It's Will, but you know now they're they you know. He's still there, and he's still doing a great job. You know, when I watch those guys live, it's it's pretty impressive. You know, and, and you know, some people are like, oh, he's trying to sound like Lane. And to me, he doesn't sound anything like Lane. He, it's like the polar opposite. He's got like a bright, almost wiry voice, and, you know, he's a tall dude, and, you know. But, he, you know, he's got the power. I did see him once with, uh, with Will, and... I loved his voice personally, and I've always yeah. thought Jerry's voice sounds closer to Lane's than Will's personally, in my opinion. Well, I think what you're hearing is you're hearing Jerry's voice on the old records under Lane, and that never went away. <laughs> That's so true, actually, yeah, you're right. You're hearing Jerry come through just more. You know, he he he's stepping forward a little bit, and you know he's he's becoming a better singer. That first record. He was, uh, yeah, actually, all the way up until Black Gives Way to Blue, he was a serious smoker. Like, I'd get to the studio, we'd work, and he's got an ashtray right next to me, and he's just blowing smoke right into the back of my head, like, all day long. And I'd have to, you know, when I get home, take a shower before I went to bed, because, you know, I smell like an ashtray. Uh, Devil Put Dinosaurs here, he uh, switched over to the patch and, like, really cut back, and... And he, he could tell in his voice it was getting better and he had more control. So he, he likes that. A lot of people often, when it comes to grunge, you know, Kurt Cobain is the one that they always remember. And rightfully so. He was, you know, the biggest one. But Lane was also very influential. Uh, yeah. Did, did Lane influence you at all personally? Like, did he touch you in any way? Well, I mean, you know, I like Facelift, when that came on, you know, uh, me and my friends, my roommate especially, he worked at this place called Moby Dick in Los Angeles, and it was a used record store, and he's like, dude, you gotta check this out, and it was, like, you know, it was like, wow, what's this? And then it was, you know, just grunge, you know, it's weird how you, you say uh, that, you know, lumping out some chains into with the grunge thing, even though they, they are, uh, they kind of get left out for some reason. Like, it's most like, it's, it's like Nirvana and Soundgarden, but they are, they were like one of the first ones that actually got signed and were out there. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, like, that was like my background of, you know, my early 20s. It's like, of course, you know, and like, you know, drop D tuning and, well, they do E flat, but it's, you know, uh, just big, heavy riffs. Yeah, I think possibly one of the reasons they get left out sometimes is, I think that Alice in Change is the heaviest of all the grunge bands, quote unquote. So 
for some people they might just consider it like alternate metal or something you know what i mean exactly yeah yeah because it, it, they're not jangly and they're not messy like that they're you know the riffs are the riffs they don't get you know they don't stray too far yeah they're very rip but you know lane had i mean like, his voice was so commanding and like you just soared over the soared over the top of all of that uh and it was such a cool thing to hear you know, instead of like the hair metal scene, you know, back then I lived in Hollywood, which is just running rampant. And they kind of put the stake in that. <laughs> Alice in Chains, from what I understand, weren't, didn't they dabble in that way back at the very beginning? You know, this is funny. Uh, so during Rainier Fog, Jerry and a good friend of his, Chris DeGarmo, and took me and Nick out to go have, uh, you know, uh, Shabu shabu, I think is what they call it when they boil the meat in the in the bowl. And uh, so, but they were talking the whole time, and Nick and I were kind of like blown away. Uh, how those two guys, you know who Chris DeGarmo is? Yeah, from Queensrÿche. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so uh, those two were talking about the scene they were in in Seattle, like the music scene when they were both coming up, and before Jerry found Lane, and it was. I mean, I wish I had recorded that because it was pretty awesome. Uh, if you get Chris DeGarmo on the phone, he'll tell you all about it. Uh, but, uh, you know, how, how he got Jeff Tate, Jeff Tate into the band, that's a funny story. But Jerry would talk about it. He's like, oh, yeah, it's like Lane was in this band, and, you know, that was the guy. And, you know, Jerry would, like, you know, he was couch surfing, I guess, until, you know, he got, you know, all of a sudden he, you know, bumped into Lane and they hit it off and they, you know, end up in a re rehearsal studio together and you know i think that's i think sean and lane were in the band together and somehow then jerry got himself in there but it was it was a wild fun story yeah yeah i've heard that uh that, that the couch surfing thing is kind of how they got into touch of the records that you worked on my favorite alice and chains song is uh, your decision i think that's a really ah. a really beautiful record yes can you talk to me like a little bit of how you guys made that particular song Well, I think a lot, like, the intro is uh, Mike Inez's bass, and he had this, like, whole setup of pedals to where he would, like, rolling rolling his volume pedal and, like, uh, or rolling his volume on the bass and recording these things to make it sound like a cello. So that was kind of, like, a, a big thing for that one. Um, that was a while ago, man. Uh, yeah, you know, this is standard. We'd get, you know, get, get the take and then just start stacking from there and building the track so cool yeah because i just uh i always i was i was always wondering was there any sort of was that inspired at all by lane's passing because it's a very emotional song was there anything in, involved with that you know so in so those songs on that record nick and i just met those guys and they were already demoed so we didn't know like nick had more of a relationship with jerry talking about like, oh hey you know these lyrics you know, when, when Nick and I work together, you know, my, my first day starting is when we load into the studio, but he had already started a month and a half before working with the band and the songs. So, uh, that's a tough one for me, but, uh, you know, uh, you could say, I, I mean, you, you, you could pick it out and some of them are, are personal, uh, you know, about, you know, girlfriends and stuff like that as well. Yeah, I hear you. Like take her, like take her out. Oh yeah, yeah, that's a good track. Yeah, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you, you mentioned that uh, for that record, you guys did part of it at Six Hundred Six Studios. Did uh, yes. Did Dave Grohl ever get involved at all in some capacity? Like, did he ever come by? I think he popped by. You know what? It's weird. Uh, I don't think we saw him until we went to Henson, and then he was you know hanging out and uh, listening to tracks and you know growing down with Jerry and you know. He, dug the record and he was super stoked um yeah i don't know if those uh, if foos were on tour then and that's why we didn't see him until we got to henson speaking of the foo fighters i was speaking recently with chris sheldon who mixed the foo fighters second record color and the shape and he was saying that in general when it comes to working with bands there's usually a little bit of a time that needs to pass before a band really opens up around you and is completely comfortable. In your experience with Alice in Chains, how long did it take until you guys were totally relaxed and comfortable around each other? Yeah, I, I would say that was like the first two weeks. Like, you know, hey, 
all right, this guy's cool. Like, okay. Like, you know, get everything set up, get the drums all dialed in, get, you know, our tracking set up, the guitars and the bass and everyone's headphones. It's like, hey, I'm not a clown over here. I know what I'm doing. I've been doing it for a while. And, you know, you show up every day and you just, you know, you just keep doing, you know, as be as professional as you can be. And they all of a sudden, they, they're like, oh, okay. Then their little door opens up. Then all of a sudden you're in and you're like, all right, cool. <laughs> then, yeah. Is there anything that from your experience with Alice in Chains that's helped you um, grow in your own work? Like anything you gain from them? Oh, absolutely. Like, uh, I mean, I don't know how many bands or, or uh, yeah, how many bands engineers get to record where the guitar player is like kind of like an icon and, you know, he does like mile wide guitar tracks and, you know, it's lots of layering. Uh, that has helped me because now it's like, okay, now I understand. It's like, hey, if that guy's just out a little bit, the tuning, you know, on the bottom, you know, you got your main riffs, those guys are out just a little bit. By the time you get to the third thing, or the fourth thing, or the fifth, all of a sudden that thing starts sticking out, and you're like, wait a second, why is this rubbing? So you gotta, you know, just pay, paying a lot of attention, and you know, like, on this stereo field, like, where's that guy gonna fit and mix later? Because I'm not mixing it, that's gonna be Randy Staub or Joe Barisi, but, you know, so it makes me think ahead now, like, okay, so these are the big guys, they can take up a bunch of space, now these other guys are gonna have to, their little shape's gotta be different. You know, to fit over and, you know, so, so people can hear it and understand. From your experience, is there anything different from working with Alice in Chains and working specifically with just Jerry Contrell on his solo projects? Yes. Well, now it's, uh, everything in Alice in Chains is a democratic process. It's like, oh, hey, I like this, I don't like that. Uh, everyone's voice has the same, you know, weight. It's, everybody's equal. Uh, for Jerry, it's it's just Jerry. It's you know it's it's Jerry. You know he's creating it. He's the architect. He's the singer. He's the guitar player. Uh, he comes up all the all the bass lines. Um, so uh, between him and the producer, they they'll sit there and they'll discuss a couple of things. But otherwise, it's it the buck stops with him. It's like you know hey no I don't like that or I like that and we need to do this. It's like all right cool. So uh, you know. The drummer is going to call me up, or the guy that played drums on this record is going to call me up. Hey, you know what? I think I want to change something. And it's like, well, that's not going to happen because that was a month ago, and you know we're already moved forward. Like, you know, if if I can fix it, I will. But we're not going to go back and retract something. Chris Sheldon told me that Dave Grohl likes to overdub his vocals. Does Chris um, does Chris Cornell does does um, Jerry Cantrell like to overdub his vocals? Like to oh his con yeah I mean like his. His vocals are, are overdubbed. So he's, we create uh, the pass, and uh, uh, then we work on all the guitars. We get all the guitars happening, then we get fit the bass in there, and then uh, then we'll start with all the all the vocals. And uh, it's you know Jerry likes like Allison Chains. He hears lots of harmonies going on. So you know he's got to you know get his lead vocal in there. Then he's got to hold on a second. No worries, take your time. Yeah, I've got a call coming in. Hopefully that didn't stop the recording. Uh, no yeah, so Jerry, you know, he'll hear harmonies and like maybe a couple weeks later, hey, you know what? I think I, I'm hearing this other harmony. It's like, all right, well, let's let's do it. Let's throw that in there. And he does it. It makes it cooler. It's like, all right, great. Very cool. And does, does he like to, um, like, mm -hmm. is there a lot of layering when it comes to like the guitars and that kind of thing with uh, Jerry? Absolutely. It's, it, you know. I would say even more so because it, now this is his solo thing. Yeah. Yeah. And does he prefer analog or digital recording? You know, I think he likes the e how easy analog is because it's like, you know, like he'll say, I'm a caveman. This thing doesn't make any sense to me. He just, you know, yeah. hey, the mic free's on, the guitar is going. Uh, he can just hit play and record. He's working uh, if I'm not there. Uh but I'll get a call. Big, you know, I'm, I'm not hearing anything. I don't. I've got my I've got my track arm. I got the mic pre on, and I'm like, okay, well, did you turn the microphone on? <laughs> and he'll be like, ah, you know. But you know, uh, just you know, the, if and that's why he hires me. It's like I I I I'm the guy running the rig and making it happen. 
uh, he doesn't have to think about it. But, you know, when I'm not there, then all of a sudden he's thrown into a situation where now it's not easy. And there are things that he doesn't understand, mm-hmm. uh, you know, about like, you know, oh, hey, we changed the input on that. Sorry. Uh, that's why you're not hearing your vocal come through that channel. And then if, you know, like right now, it's like we tracked a bunch of stuff for Jerry at a couple of studios. Now, for vocals and, like, small overdubs, we could be at his house because I don't have to drag around a giant mixing desk and a tape machine and, you know, turn his house inside out just to, you know, get a couple of things done. And actually, you know, he's got a small uh, workstation rig at his house and, you know, we're able to get uh, some quality work done. So for you personally, what's the most rewarding part of your job? I get, you know, like when, you know, and this goes back to, like, when we were getting guitar sounds for Jerry, when... You know, Nick and I were dialing in these sounds, and like, you know, Jerry's gone. The next day he comes in, we're like, all right, this is this is the test. Do we get it? Do we pass or do we fail? And Jerry put his guitar on, and and he starts playing a couple of riffs, and he's just like, yeah, and he smiles right there. That is what it's all about, like making your client happy, and, and you know, and you know, making him happy. He doesn't have to worry about anything else anymore. It's like. All right, cool. We just did our job. Do you have any funny Alice in Chain stories? Well, you know, Jerry loves Halloween. And so, like, uh, when we were the first time, 606, and, you know, it was Halloween, he came in, and everybody's got, like, these, like, inflatable, you know, those inflatable nylon costumes. Like, you know, he's a, you're a cowboy riding a horse, but your legs are the horses, you know, just walking around like that. It's funny stuff. But, yeah, no, the, it, you know, Sean and those guys are hilarious. And Sean, you, know, you get him on a rant, and he just won't stop. And it's, you know, it's like, all right, all right, got to get back to work. But uh, all great guys. Uh, yeah, no, when we're, we're in the studio, we, we work. So, uh, you know, there's, there's some shenanigans. You know, we like to, you know, roll dice in between tuning guitars, and that becomes hilarious in itself. So I guess that's one, one thing. You know, just guys having fun in the studio. Yeah, man. No, I can imagine. That's funny. Uh, just offhand, I just remembered, I, I spoke with Ernie Bailey recently in Nirvana's old guitar tech, and he told mm-hmm. me that um, Dave Grohl, and like he's a good friend of Dave Grohl's, and he said like he Dave is like absolutely notorious for pranking people like all the time, constantly. So is, is that ever yeah. happening with you guys? Are there like, are, like pranks happening and that kind of thing? Uh, no, not much. You know, everyone kind of like sticks into their own zone. Uh, let's see. Like if Jerry's out there doing something like, you know, stretching, you know, trying to get it back, you know, to, to not, you know, ache so much and he's making a, a noise and I'll record it and then I'll play it back. And it's like, you know, what the fuck is that? And then he just starts laughing because it just sounds like, you know, the porno or something. <laughs> That's hilarious. You should have yeah, a whole record yeah. of just Jerry's sounds. <laughs> yeah, no, I try to, I, when I'm rolling, I, and, you know, when he, especially when he starts singing, it's like, it's pretty funny. It's like, you know, he's just putting his gum down, burping, or taking a swig of uh, whatever, and, you know, uh, you know, just trying to, he's letting go of his thing. It's pretty funny. Yeah, that's cool, man. Mm-hmm. So, um, we were talking a little bit earlier about how Alice in Chains is very riff-based. Um, one of the songs you worked on that I really enjoy is Stone. That, that, that yeah. song is very very riff heavy um what was it like working on that particular song i mean like it's like all of them i mean you know i'm amazed each time you know jerry just comes down and throws you know he just does that thing and 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 i see when when he loosens up or pulls a little too sharp or doesn't get there in time and i'll stop and then he's like damn it fig he's like you know and i'm like you know no but you know so it's just you know i I hear where he's going and what he's doing and, and where it's what, the level he needs to be at and where he knows he's going to be at. And, uh, and he respects that from me, but, uh, you know, and particularly that song, cause it's so riff heavy and there's like, you know, there's a bunch of guitars on this side and that side and the center. And then, you know, the, and the, you know, the, all the little flavor guitars is what he calls them. That's awesome. Um, is it, is there, has there ever been any one particular song that was very difficult to record properly? No, no, no. Like when the sun rose, that was, that was, that was a little difficult because that was like a baritone acoustic guitar. And then, you know, we had this tabla player came in and he had a, you know, I don't know if you ever recorded tabla, but that's kind of a wild instrument. And you sit down and it's like all, you know, it's kind of, it's an Indian instrument. And, uh, he, you know, he's a 
professor at one of these colleges around town, and uh, he came in to do it, and you know Jerry had to strum the thing out. That one was a little little tricky, and then getting the uh, I think then on Black is Way to Blue, getting the there's a vibraphone on there, and uh, that was a little sticky, and you know Sean was doing trying to do it, and it was like ah. Oh, you know, but we were at Henson, and Wendy and Lisa from, you know, Prince's, Wen uh, Wendy and Lisa from the Power Gen, or not Power Gen, but from Prince's band, uh, they had a little uh, production space upstairs, and Wendy plays vibraphone. So she came down, and she's like, oh, yeah, sure, and she did it for, for the guys. It was pretty fun. So aside from Alice in Chains, you've worked with lots of major artists. Is there any one in particular that you were excited to work with? I got the call to work with Marty Friedman. And that was pretty fun because I remember when I was a kid, you know, le le young Shredder, and I'd see his flyers all over town. You know, so meeting, I mean, that guy works so fast. It was like we did drums in four days with the Noop Stay Street, and I don't know if you know who he is, but what a maniac. And he, he'd do like two, two or three takes, and he's just a mathematician with like the fastest feet and just makes everything look so effortless. And then Marty comes in, all right, great, cool. All right, let's do some guitars. And you just throw them around. Okay, another one, another one, another one, another one. And next thing you know, you got like some, you know, a main riff and a giant melody line with harmonies just stacked forever. And you're just like, wow, okay. But that was pretty exciting too. Um, is he still in Japan? Yeah, he is. Yeah, he just did, they just did a tour last, I think it was last summer. And I got to see them at the Viper Room. It was pretty cool. I got to sit with his folks up at the, at the front. Um, yeah, who else? Um, Were you a Megadeth fan growing up? I was not. You know, being LA based, it was like you know, uh, I don't, I don't know. It was like I was, I was super into Metallica coming up, and then you know, getting into the punk scene, uh, that that struck the chord with me. Megadeth, not so much for some reason. Interesting. Even though you're a fan of Marty. Yeah. Well, because yeah. It, it, it's weird, but I, you know, as you know, like I was saying, through my music career or coming up, and you know, through the music stores or whatever, and you know, it's like that guy, you know, he left the band and did his own thing, and you know, and he's still doing it, and the guy, the guy just, you know, totally shreds. He has a maniac. <laughs> you know, it's uh, I, I met Nick Menza um, a few months before he passed. Actually, I recorded him for a documentary I was making called "What Is Classic Rock," and. Mm -hmm. uh, when he passed, I was like, man, first of all, it's just sad that he passed away. But then it's like, secondly, it's like Megadeth had that chance to have that classic reunion with Marty and Nick and they passed on it. Would you happen to know why in particular Dave Grohl loves Sound City Studios as much as he does? I know his relationship with Sound City goes way back to the Nirvana Nevermind days, of course. I think, uh, well, one, yeah. So, yeah, Nevermind was tracked there and that Neve desk. And, you know, there was another Neve desk very similar at a place called Grandmaster. But it wasn't the same, and it wasn't the same control room. There's, there was a magic between that drum room and that desk. And uh, so I think Dave, I mean, like, Sound City wasn't super expensive. And, you know, they didn't upgrade to SSL because they couldn't afford it. So that kind of, like, created a niche for them accidentally because all of a sudden they're stuck with this, you know, 28-input console. It's like, you know, this giant built-like-a-tank thing. And uh, everyone's moving over to SSL and like, you know, lots of, you know, routing and, uh, you know, just feature, you know, rich console. Uh, but, you know, hey, you can get into the studio and get world class sounds for, you know, a, a decent amount of money. Like not, you know, you don't, you're, not, you're not paying $2,000 a day to get into this place. So that might have been a cool thing. He did a band called Verbena there that turned out pretty good. Um, and then he brought in Rye Coalition. I don't know if you ever got into them. Uh and he would just keep coming back. So, you know, if you needed drums and a great drum room, that was the place to go. And he's a drummer. A great one, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I was speaking with uh, Steve Albini a little while back, and he said that he thinks Dave Grohl is one of the best drummers ever. Like, period. Like, he really felt very strongly yeah. about that. Yeah. And um, so I was speaking with Chris Sheldon, as I mentioned, the one of the mixers from the Foo Fighters' Color and the Shape record. He said that um, for... I believe the song My Hero, they recorded the drums in like an empty parking garage or something, like so they can get that really big ambient sound. Yes. Mm -hmm. Has there ever been any kind of funky thing like that you've done to get like a specific sound when you're recording? Well, uh, no, absolutely. So uh, 
yeah, I've done things where uh, I'm in a warehouse. It gets pretty splashy, but then if you want to get really creative, uh, you know, using a big garage door that you know for the warehouse as a percussion instrument, and that's fun too. Then you just crush that thing and you know stretch it out if you want. Just it just sounds otherworldly. Yeah, yeah. That's, that, I never even thought about that. I'm gonna give it a shot after this. <laughs> <laughs> what exactly is the current state of Sound City? Well, the Sound City I was part of isn't around any longer. So that Sound City's gone. The desk is at Dave Grohl's. Uh, most of the gear got sold off, you know, on eBay to whoever. Um, but uh, then they, uh, this guy Kevin Agunis came in and changed. You know, he, the space was still there. The space never disappeared. Uh, so you still have a control room and a tracking room, uh, and uh, he he put in you know some tube. Altec desk and he had you know all this like you know, 50s and 60s type equipment which was okay but there's a reason why people don't go all the way that far back to create records um, but you know uh, so then that guy left and then some other guy came in and it was Sound City 2.0 and he brought in a couple of Helios desks which are interesting that's alright well that's a, a step in the right direction and then so they had a falling out. So uh, the, the property owners, Sandy Skeeter, who, who took over after her dad passed, he owned the whole complex. Uh, now there's a Sound City is back. They've got a Neve desk or a Neve type desk in there. And, but it's, uh, it's uh, Blake Mills and Tony Bird. So uh, they're keeping the place busy just with their own projects. So, uh, like, I was trying to get a band in there, uh, like, right after they, they got in. I'm like, hey, can, I just need, like, four or five days to track drums. You know, it'd be great to hear what this desk sounds like in that room. I, you know, I've been here for a while. I, I'm, I'm curious, and it's, it's nice to come back. And Tony is like, you know, absolutely, you know, whatever you want, Fig. And I'm like, great. And then I get a call. Like, nobody got back to me until, like, three months later. Hey, that time is booked. And I was just like, oh, it's okay. I got that sorted out. But that's where I'll, I'll go. If I need to record, you know, big drums, I'll go to Dave Grohl's studio because I can still get in there. Now that everything's become so digital, do you need like a good mixing board to, to make a good mix? Or is that getting more passe nowadays? It's now for, for tracking, you're going to, you're going to always want a desk for me, at least it's, I'm going to always want to like, you know, bust things or, uh, be able to monitor in real time on the desk instead of having to grab a mouse and like, oh, hey, all hell's breaking loose. Hold on two seconds. Uh, having the desk for tracking is pretty important. Now for mixing, you know, if you can afford to get into a room and your client has enough money to pay for you and the studio, hey, great, get in there. Otherwise, it's like, uh, all right, let's create a hybrid setup that can go mobile. Uh, it's going to be a lot of routing in the box but at the same time i've got like a rack full of outboard gear that i use to bring in the analog elements and it just helps make things wider and less sterile does that make sense i don't know if, if, you, if you're not into recording no, no I'm, I'm a so i'm a filmmaker but I, but i've been around music for years so i do have like somewhat of an understanding but okay got it but but the, the mixing board i've always i've never fully understood the board so i'm trying to learn more about that right because it's like yeah for example i saw the one um like one of the classic album docs where Butch Vig was talking yeah. about how he made Nevermind and he was showing how on one of the tracks Dave Grohl's vocals are like underneath Kurt's and he was pressing buttons on the mixing board to just highlight that one element. So I was always curious like how do you get that one how do you get like a button to stand for this is Jerry Control's voice and then this is William's voice. Like is that easy to program like that? Oh well so it's it's basically laid out on how your tape is playing back. So you've got a 24 track machine in the machine room spitting out 24 channels. And he's, that spreads out from channel 1 to 24 on your console. So, all right, well, Kurt's voice is on 22 and Dave's is on 23 or 25 or, you know, wherever. If you have Pro Tools, it's going to be more than 25, 24. Uh, if you have two tape decks, up to 48 channels or tracks. Um, so it's just. It, you know, for tape, it's easy. It's just 
it's numbers. It's like one through how many, where, how many ever cha- tracks you have on tape. Uh, Pro Tools, all right, well, okay, so hey, one through 12 are going to be all drums. The next four are going to be uh, bass. So that's just I.O., you know, set up. You know, you're just, you know, routing, you know, your channels to certain channels in Pro Tools to actual physical channels on a desk. Oh, very cool. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, but everything's out of everything's out of hardware wire. So it's like, hey, I want this vocal to go out channel fourteen, which is also the same. The wire fourteen goes to the channel fourteen on the desk. That makes sense. Okay. Cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, so, do you prefer working with analog or digital when you have the option? Well, I I, I like working with analog front end. Now, tape is is fun. I don't think people can afford it. It's, you know, it, it, the time it takes to get the tape, you know, well, one, sourcing the tape, and then, you know, getting it aligned and, you know, getting your record, your record pad di- dialed in and, you know, setting your, uh, your bias and that whole thing and aligning it. All right, great. Now you've got, you got your tape. Now you're recording on it. You do a pass. Oh great! Can we do? It's like okay, yeah, we can, but we got to rewind first. Okay, now we're back, and you know, and it's it, 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 it's 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 a kind of a cool workflow if you have the time to do that. But otherwise, it's like people, you know, budgets are small now, and it's like all right, well, all right, let's do. We're gonna we're gonna start again from the top. Everybody ready? Yep, let's go. Boom! And you're you know, as soon as you make that announcement, they're back in the game. Uh, having to stop and rewind, yeah, it only takes like, you know, maybe thirty seconds or a minute tops to depending on how long the song is. But uh, I, I prefer digital just for that. You can work quick. Yeah, I agree. And so, in terms of Dave Grohl, a producer that's worked extensively with the Foo Fighters is Nick Raskulenitz, and Nick, of course, has also worked with Alice in Chains. So, how did your relationship start with Nick Raskulenitz? How did you start your relationship with Nick? Okay, so uh, we're both Sound City guys, and so and then you know back to you know my how I came up into music into doing this. Amen. We're at Sound City recording their third record, the second record for Virgin, and uh, you know the singer was just hopped up on goofballs and drinking his own Kool Aid, and you know uh, things came to a head, and I was like, all right, well then I'm done, and you know I, I was. You know, talking with the studio manager Siobhan O'Brien about you know interning or getting hired, and you know she's like, you know, all right, well, you can start when these guys leave, and so I just you know I went from Virgin Records to the Runner Desk, and uh, just you know read manuals, like just watched and listened and asked questions when I could, um, and then you know became an assistant engineer, and then Nick came back. You know, he had already gone freelance because he did, you know, uh, Foo's record, One by One. And and uh, he was working with this band. I want to say they were, they were called the Exes anyways. You know, I came in, I was, you know, serious attention to detail. My documentation was spot on. And, you know, him and, you know, just helping him and the engineer make the most of their time at Sound City. And, uh, you know, that then his uh, his engineer quit. And from then on, he, he called me and was like, hey, Fig, you know, you want to come help me record, you know, I went from Sound City to, you know, start going freelance with Nick. We've been working ever since. Hey, guys, thanks for watching. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe for more because there is a lot more to come. All the videos on my channel are original. I'm the one filming, editing, and conducting all the interviews. So if you guys like what you see and you want to support, the best way to do so is honestly just to subscribe. Thanks for watching.